Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today I would like to talk about a special device which is called solenoid. Um, it's very widely used in um, whatever we deal with uh, related to electricity. It's just everywhere. Almost all the different devices have this type of a um, device. Um, anyway, uh, it's very important and it's also very important from educational uh, point of view because the calculations related to magnetic field inside the solenoid are, well, I would say exemplary um, as far as basically most of the calculations in physics are. It's a combination of good math um, and certain uh, physical properties which we come up with from experiments or something like that. So, um, it's very important to be familiar with um, regular course of mathematics which includes calculus and simple integration because this particular lecture will involve vectors and calculus. That's what I'm always talking about that at least these two uh, parts of the mass is, uh, are, are very important. Now, uh, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens presented on Unizor.com and on the same website you can find the prerequisite course which is called Mass for Teens. Um, so I do recommend you to watch the lecture from the website um, you, because you might actually find it on YouTube where it's physically located but it's linked from the website. And the website is um, important in, um, in the sense that every lecture has textual um, notes and uh, it's basically like a textbook because everything, whatever I'm talking, is already there written down. Uh, maybe even better <laughs> than, than the way um, I'm explaining this. So you can use it as a both as a textbook and as a source of visual representation. Um, and again, the Mass for Teens, the prerequisite course, is very important. It's also on the same website. Um, and the site is completely free, by the way. No advertisement. All right, so let's go to our solenoids. <coughs> so first of all, what is a solenoid and what do we want to do with it? Well, solenoid is a simple thing. It's basically a spiral of a wire. It's connected to some kind of a source of energy, a battery. We are talking about direct current. And we know that around any um, electric wire, if there is a current in it, there is a magnetic field. So there is a magnetic field around each of these loops. Now, in the previous lecture, <coughs> We, we were talking about one single loop and magnetic field in, in, in the, at the center of this loop. And we will use the same technique here. But in our case, we would like to evaluate the magnetic field inside the solenoid. Now, um, the way how mathematicians usually um, consider physical problems, they are abstracting out certain purely physical aspects. So, number one, we are considering that our solenoid is infinite in both ends. That's number one. Um, well, obviously, you can start calculating if it's a com if it's a it's a finite, but th then the the calculations might be a little bit more um, intense and uh, it's not for the, f uh, for the educational purpose because these, this lecture is just educational purpose. It, it, it would like to basically explain how things are done in, in some very general and as simple as possible cases. So, uh, we are dealing with infinite in length solenoid. Number two, we are assuming that the wire is very thin. So there are no, like, inside the wire, the direction of the current is always along the wire. 
nothing goes uh, sideways. So it's a thin wire. And um, so how can we define this solenoid? Well, there are uh, two major characteristics. Number one is radius. And number two is how many loops you have per unit of length. So it's density of loops, because you can actually have it very loosely, or you can have it very densely. And obviously, the field inside should depend on the density of the uh, of the loops, right? So R. radius and density n. So it's n loops per meter, let's say, if we're talking about C uh, system of uh, physical units. And R is also meters in this case. All right, so these two are given. Now, um, it's very important to understand that in our case we will calculate the intensity of the magnetic field at the axis inside the solenoid. Well, that's simpler because it's the same distance from the um, surrounding wire um, and uh, it allows to calculate things simpler. Now, um, it is possible to calculate the intensity of this field not on the center line of the solenoid. So if this is the solenoid, so this is the center line, the axis. But let's say a certain distance from, from this uh, wire. And it, I don't really know exactly the result. Um, the textbooks and I didn't do the calculations myself. Textbooks usually are saying that you can consider the field inside the solenoid, everywhere inside the solenoid, as, a, as uniform. Well, being as it may, we are not really talking about calculation at any point, but on the axis, all right? Um, now, it's also important to understand that since our solenoid is infinite in both ends, it's completely symmetrical as far as which point exactly on the axis I will choose to measure my magnetic field, because in both ends from this field you will have an infinite solenoid. So I can choose any point, basically. It should be the same. Because of infinity, it should be the same. If it's not infinite, then you might say that if it's finite length, that somewhere at the edge, it might actually be not exactly the same as in the middle. And probably it will not in real practical cases. But for, for simplicity, we assume it's infinite uh, because the calculations are easier, basically, that's it. I mean, still involved, but just easier. Now, so what I will do is I will position this solenoid in such a way that it goes, that its, its axis coincides with x-axis in my system of coordinates, all right? And a point where I will measure my, or calculate rather, my um, magnetic field intensity will be just the beginning, the, uh, the or or origin of coordinates, point zero, zero, zero. So this is the zero point, this is the x-axis, now, somewhere there is a z and y axis, doesn't really matter, but I'm stretching my solenoid along the x axis and I'm measuring at the origin of coordinate at point x is equal to zero. I'm measuring my magnetic intensity. Okay, now, what's the plan? How can I really calculate the magnetic intensity of an entire solenoid? Well, we will do it in three steps. Step number one, we will choose one particular loop. Now this is an x-axis. I will choose one particular loop 
at the distance x from the origin of coordinates and I will try to calculate the magnetic field at this point. Now in the previous lecture we calculated at the center of this um, loop if you remember. That was a previous lecture. Now in this lecture we will calculate a certain distance x from the center and this is still a known radius, right? Um, so that's my step number one. Step number two. Step number two, I will have certain infinitesimal piece dx on my axis of solenoid and I will consider all the wires all the loops which are inside this dx and I will use obviously the density for this and I will basically multiply whatever the magnetic field from one loop I will multiply by this number of loops to find out what is the contribution of a dx length of an entire solenoid contribution into the magnetic field of this at this point and finally, the third step is I will integrate the whole thing by dx by x from minus infinity to plus infinity because the solenoid is infinite in both ends. So again, one loop first, then I have all the loops which fit into the infinitesimal um, part of, uh, of the solenoid along, along its axis, and then I will integrate. So. Let's just do it one by one. Number one, again, let's go back to our primary, more, I would say, most involved. If you have one loop, and I would like to find out, this is zero, this is x, and uh, this is r, obviously. This is R. Let's put it inside. So how can I calculate the magnetic field from this loop? I will basically repeat the same logic as I was using when I was calculating the center. But it will be a little bit more involved. Not by much. Some geometry might be involved and some trigonometry and then integration. <laughs> okay, um, so what I will do first is I will choose, um, yes, b before that let me just say that obviously all these pieces of this loop are in exactly the same position relative to point where I would like to measure, uh, calculate my magnetic field intensity because it's completely symmetrical, right? This is the loop. Now the axis is perpendicular to it. And so the distance from this point to any point on a, on a circle is the same. Now, so what I will do is I will choose one particular infinitesimal piece of the length ds, differential of s, and I will calculate what is the magnetic field intensity produced by this little piece only. And then I will add all these magnetic uh, field intensities. Uh, well, actually it's, a, it, it's integration, but it's a very simple integration because the magnetic field intensity at this point from this will be exactly the same. So, um, the way how um, you calculate the result of the direct current in this point, the uh, result of magnetic field intensity in this, is something which we have discussed many times before. Um, now, the basic formula is that intensity B is equal to mu zero, and we did discuss this before. 
times i. i is obviously the current, so it should be proportional to the current, right? It's also proportional to the length of this um, segment and inversely proportional to square of a distance, right? So d is a distance. Now more exact formula, if you remember, was I have to add 4 pi here. Now speaking about distance, well, when I, when I was calculating the center, my distance was the radius. Now when I'm calculating on the uh, axis which is perpendicular to the circle, but on the distance x from the center, it would be what? It's a Pythagorean theorem, right? This is x and this is r. So the square of a distance would be, uh, would be r squared plus x squared. So this is something which we have started with. But then, if you remember, if this is my current, I, this is my ds, and if I'm measuring here, which is different from here, now this is perpendicular, and this formula is good for the perpendicular. If I'm at the angle here, then this segment is seen a little bit smaller, right? So I have to multiply by a sine of this angle. Now let's see if I have this situation here. If this my segment is on a circle and the point is on the perpendicular to the plane, then since this is perpendicular to the whole plane where this circle is located, where this loop is located, my segment belongs to the plane right? So my OX is always perpendicular to this particular uh, uh, o, 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 a. My OA is always perpendicular to, uh, to the segment. Um, it's probably easier to see if you draw a cone. If this is a cone. This is our loop. And this is point O. Now no matter where I take this particular segment, this line would always be perpendicular. Okay? Because this segment is supposed to be a tangential, right? So, tangential is perpendicular to radius, and this is perpendicular to the radius, so it would be a um, right triangle, if you wish, but in any case it's kind of obvious that this particular line is perpendicular to any tangential line here. So we have the perpendicularity of this uh, segment, of this segment, to the point, and I don't have to add any kind of a sign of, uh, of any angle here, because this is al always perpendicular. So this line, which goes from the um, top of the cone to, um, uh, to the circle at the base, is always perpendicular to, um, to the tangential line to a circle. That's kind of a very easy problem in uh, space geometry. And again, if you will go to the Mass 14th course here, um, there is the whole chapter on space geometry, which I do recommend you to, to know. So in this case, this is something which we are using from the geometry, which actually allows us not to put any kind of a sign of anything, because this segment is always perpendicular. If it's here, it's perpendicular. If it's here, it's always perpendicular to, um, to the distance to the vector, to my point, wherever I'm measuring this. Okay, so this is a contribution of one particular segment, all right? Okay, now, 
what should I do next? Next, I would like to know what's the um, magnetic field at this point from an entire loop. So, what I have to do is, I have to basically integrate it along the whole circle. Well, but since it's, it does not really depend on anything, i is constant, r is constant, x is constant, so the only thing integration is gs, so it's like integrative integral of gs, which is actually the, the total circumference of, of the loop, which is 2 pi r. So whenever I'm integrating this, I will get this. Well, can I do it? Actually, not exactly. And here is the point. Now, the vector of magnetic field is always perpendicular to both direction of the um, current, which is basically the direction of the, this segment, and the line which connects my source of the electricity uh, and the point where I'm calculating. So remember, if you have vector of i is this, vector of point to towards here, my magnetic always my magnetic intensity is always perpendicular to both. Now, what does it mean in this particular case? It would be more convenient if I will look at this not in a 3D way but um, if I will look perpendicularly to the loop. If I will look perpendicularly to the loop, what, would, the, what would, would happen? So my loop will be like a line, right? So my loop is this. My, this line is axis. Now, how is my um, electricity direction? let's say at this point this is A well if this is my loop my electricity is going perpendicular to the board right so this is my vector of electricity so this is direction of the GS right on the bottom is also this uh, now, as the loop goes this way, for instance, it would be this direction. So this is direction of the... But in this case, on the top, it will be perpendicular to the board. That's very important. It's easier to do this. Now, all A is on the board. Now, so what is the direction of my um, magnetic field intensity at this point? It should be perpendicular to this. So it should be somewhere on this plane. And it should be perpendicular to this. But since this is perpendicular to the board, then my line should be really within the board. So this is real direction of the B but as a vector. It's perpendicular to this line, and it's perpendicular to the GS because GS is perpendicular to the whole board, which means perpendicular to any line on the board. Again, back to the space geometry. So, this picture now, which is on on this board, is really a two-dimensional, exact two-dimensional representation, and this is exact direction of the B uh, vector, magnetic intensity. It's perpendicular to this. Now, if you will take, for instance, point here, it will be perpendicular to this. Now, what happens here, the B vector would be in this particular kind of position. Here, 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 here. And now I have to add them up all together. I cannot add them up just based on their magnitude because vector like this for instance will always be represented as a sum of two vectors 
one goes along the axis, which is B prime, and another is B perpendicular to the axis. Now, this vector, magnetic intensity, which is produced by this segment, will also have this component and this component. And what's interesting is that all components along the axis will be the same for all the different Bs. But the components which is perpendicular to axis, for instance, this will be cancelled with the opposite one. And if you take any point on the loop and the opposite point, again, their uh, projections on, uh, on the perpendicular to the axis would cancel each other. And only those projections on the axis will be in the same direction. And that's what I have to add. So instead of adding the vector with magnitude of uh, vector b, I have to actually add only their projections on the axis, because these projections are always the same for any point on the loop. So what is exactly this particular projection? Well, look at it this way. This is perpendicular to this. Now this is perpendicular to this. So this angle is equal to this angle. And I need a sine of this angle, right? I need to multiply my magnitude by sine of this angle to get projection on the axis. And I know the sine of this angle because this is x, this is r, and this is square root of r, r, r square plus x square, right? So my sine is equal r divided by uh, square root of. So I have to really multiply this by r and divide it by square root. So this is the first degree and square root of one half. So it will be three half here. And this is x component. That's what we are looking for. Not just b, because we cannot really add vectors which are directed differently. But we will take projections on the x-axis that all the, these vectors can be added together. And there another component will always be cancelled and will always be, if I will summarize them, it will always be zero. So these projections are going in all different directions like this. And again, this will be cancelled with this. Now, these projections are always going along the x-axis, and I can add them together. So if I will add this together, this is actually not the, B, uh, the entire bx. This is only differential, which is produced by a specific thing. And now I basically have to integrate it, which means I have to multiply it instead of ds. I have to multiply it by the entire 2 pi r. Get, that gives me r square, and this is the final um, uh, magnetic field uh, produced by the one particular loop at point zero, if loop is on a distance x. Okay. Fine. By the way, the picture in my uh, on my website is slightly better than whatever I have just drawn. Um, okay, so this is something which is important. This is from one loop only. Now, what I will do next is... So let's go back to my solenoid. So what I will do next is, from x to x plus dx, all the loops which are on this particular segment of the x-axis. How many of them? Well, if density is n, so for every uh, unit of length I have n loops. Now, the, if length is dx, then the number of loops is n times dx. Right? So, in this case, B of, let's put it of X, um, 
would be equal to the same formula just multiplied by n and dx and I will have differential also here pi uh, well obviously 2 pi will uh, cancel with 2 pi here so I will have r square n dx that's number of loops per dx from 4 pi 2 pi I have still 2 r square plus x square to the power of 3 seconds and what I have to do next is I have to integrate it by x from x is equal to minus infinity to x is equal to plus infinity and that would be my answer that would be the real b so b is equal to integral from minus infinity to plus infinity mu i r square n dx divided by 2 r square plus x square 3 2 don't get scared it's no big deal now but I would like to point out that your math knowledge should be sufficient not to get scared by these calculations whatever I'm just making this is the goal and if you are uncomfortable go back to calculus course here or on math routines or, or anywhere else whatever and you have to really make yourself comfortable if you would like to really know physics you have to be very comfortable with mathematics okay now what about this guy well first of all let me just take all the multipliers out so I will <coughs> so I will have mu zero is a constant i is a constant r square is a constant n is a constant uh, divided by two is a constant and then I have integral from minus to plus infinity dx divided by r square plus x square to the power of three seconds now how this particular integral should be dealt with well first of all um, the obvious representation x should be equal to r times uh, let's say t which means dx is equal to r dt and why did I do it well well if x is minus infinity to plus infinity t will also be minus infinity to plus infinity because it's just multiplication by r so I will have uh, the same mu i r square n divided by 2 integral of minus to plus infinity and now we are integrating by t so instead of dx I will put r dt and instead of x here I will have r square plus x square would be r square t square to the power of 3 seconds right Well, obviously now r square can be taken out from here. r square to the power of 3 seconds would be r to the power of 2 times 3 divided by 2, so it's r cubed. So the whole result would be mu 0 i r square n divided by 2. Now this r cube obviously should go out. Uh, am I right? I think I made some mistake by r square, right?
Okay, and integral dt divided by... Oh, I have another r here. That's why. So it's cube. I see that something is wrong. Cube. r square and r is r cube. And r uh, square to the power of 3 seconds is also cube. I know that r should actually disappear. That's why I was concerned. And here I have 1 plus t square to the power of 3 seconds. Right. Now, you see how important this is? Our final formula does not depend on the radius of solenoid. That's what's important. Okay, now, what about this integral? Well, the easiest thing I can say right now is I can just give you an answer. Because it's really not very difficult. Again, you have to be relatively comfortable to, to take the integrals like this. But basically, um, I think the story is that um, the t divided by 1 plus t square um, uh, to the power of, let me see, uh, I think it's 3 seconds, but I'm not really once, one, yeah, square root, sorry. I think it's square root, yes. I think this is the function which, if you will um, get its derivative, will give you this. And we can check it out. Uh, I just don't want right now to do it because it will take some time. Um, but uh, when I was actually trying to find out this integral, now this is from minus infinity to plus infinity. First you have to do is you have to get the uh, function derivative of which is equal to this. And there are some methods which uh, we, we used to get this function. And I think this is the function which I have found. Now if this is an indefinite integral, therefore, if derivative of this is equal to this, so this is the indefinite integral of this. Well, plus c, obviously. And I have to really put uh, the limits right now. This is the formula, uh, Newton-Leibniz formula. If you have um, the indefinite integral, so the definite integral should be just indefinite, substituting the limits. Okay, now, if we substitute the limits, obviously constant disappears, so we don't really need it. If you substitute uh, uh, infinity, you will have uh, this, okay, t divided by 1 plus t square square root. Um, if you will, now if it's a plus infinity, so let's divide everything by t, it would be 1 divided by this divided by t, or square root divided by t square would be 1 divided by t square plus 1, right? And obviously if t is equal to infinity, the whole thing is equal to 1. Now, how about minus infinity? Well, if minus infinity, then minus t is positive, so I will divide it to minus uh, t, and that would be what? If I divide by minus t, which is positive in both cases, I will have minus 1 here. Now, minus t is positive, so I will just put it under the square root, so it will be the same thing. And again, it would be infinity, so the whole thing would be minus 1. So the whole result would be 1 minus minus 1, which is what? 2. So the whole thing is equal to 2. And that 2 will cancel out this 2, and the whole answer would be mu0, i, n. You see how simple the formula, final formula is? That's worth, actually, all these calculations. The complicated calculations sometimes give you a simple formula, which, uh, which signifies that maybe we did something right. Okay. All right. So um, what's important is this is the magnetic field at the center line of the solenoid at its axis, and 
textbooks usually are saying that everywhere else inside this infinite solenoid, uh, the magnetic field is exactly the same. I did not check it, and I think there is some deviation from this, but probably very small ones. Uh, so I'm not making any judgment right now. You can just trust the te textbooks. I did not verify it with calculations. Other than that, that's a very interesting uh, formula. It does not depend on the radius of the solenoid. So if solenoid is big or small, as long as it's infinite, the magnetic field inside, at least along the axis, will be the same. <laughs> now, now, my feeling is that if really the radius is very big, then somewhere near the, uh, the wire itself, uh, it should be different than, let's say, in the center. Because in the center, if, if a very big radius in the center, well, it looks like it's further from the, from the edges, but at the same time it's infinite length. So, again, it needs some really detailed and involved calculations, which I did not do, and let's just trust the textbooks that they're saying that, okay, the, the, the field is uniform and does not depend whether it's on the axis of the solenoid or slightly above or, 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 or below it. And it does not depend on the radius. All right, so that's basically it for today. Thank you very much. I do suggest you to read all the notes for this lecture on the unizor.com. You go to electromagnetism and magnetic properties of the current, and that's where you find this lecture. Thanks very much, and good luck. <laughs>